from the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Banker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives on men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. When was the last time you heard something positive in the media about men? It could be in the news or in a commercial or in a television program or in film. Yeah, that's what I thought. And when was the last time you read a magazine article or a novel in which a man was not at the root of a woman's problem? I'm guessing I'm hearing crickets right about now. Today, I'm going to be talking with someone who has made it his mission to, quote, restore masculinity back to men worldwide and to build a positive future for men, boys, and fathers. His name is Anthony Dream Johnson. And yes, I asked him about the name Dream. We'll get to that. He is achieving his mission via the internet in a space that's known as the manosphere. Anthony is a CEO and entrepreneur who took the bold step of dropping out of college and transforming people's lives through self-improvement and personal development. He built an organization, 21 Studios, and the 21 Convention that guides men on how to become successful people in their businesses and lives, to understand what it means to be an ideal man, and to improve their relationships with women and themselves. Anthony's style is very different from mine. He's quite bombastic and likes to curse a lot, so I asked him to hold that down a little bit for our conversation today, which he did. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Uh, Glad to be here. Appreciate you having me on, Susan. Suzanne. Suzanne. Pardon me. Pardon moi. That's That's okay. I get that all the time. Like I'll order something from, you know, some food or whatever. And it's uh, Suzanne always gets turned into Susan. I think because people don't hear the word name Suzanne very often, but Susan is very common. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to begin by just sort of telling everybody how you and I met, I guess you could say, um, earlier this year. So let's, let's start with that. Yeah, I believe I just reached out to you by email. Um, I was looking for basically anti-feminist, pro-femininity kind of authors uh, for women. And that's a much different tune than what I took in 2020 when the event Make Women Great Again 22 convention was explicitly 100% mansplaining. Uh, So I took a pivot (laughs) in 2021 and I found some Janice obviously was, uh, you know, the keynote or supposed to be the keynote. Unfortunately, that was not able to happen. Janice Fumango. Janice Fumango, yeah, professor. So we just re- I reached out to you over email, and I do that from time to time, trying to find new speakers. And uh, I kind of figured you would be a little bit uh, didn't know what to make of it when you probably saw the <laughs> website. It's very very polarizing. The attendees have told me that different speaker. I mean, obviously yeah. it's super polarizing. The world told me that in 2020 because when we launched the event you just spoke at for women, the 22 convention, the spinoff of the 21 convention for men, it went viral. It reached 150 million people on social media, terrestrial radio. Uh, major international TV with Piers Morgan, the newspapers, everything. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna play that um, later. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, you know, I, you told me that you reached out to Janice right away, who I love so much, and in my understanding, she kind of vouched for me. And like Anthony is not playing around; he's very polarizing, like a like a Trump almost. But uh, yeah, I'm, I mean what I say, and I mean what I do, even if it's hyperbole sometimes, and uh, ramped up through the roof just to anger yeah. my enemies and people I don't like. Let me start there for a minute because I was going to have to talk about this later, but since you brought it up, mm-hmm. yeah, that is what I did. And and part of the reason I <clears throat> was checking with someone who knew you because I, I, I certainly don't shy away from anything polarizing. Some would yeah. consider me very polarizing. Obviously, that, I made a career on that myself. It's just that um, the manosphere, which I guess I'll just have you explain what that is now. I was going to do that later. Sure. But it's, it's comprised of all different kinds of men who are in that space. And I didn't yep. know which one you were. That's okay. the bottom line. And the reason is, is because for several years, I've had those folks, some of those folks on my Facebook page, and I've let them do their thing for years uninterrupted. I'm not a banner. I don't, you know, it's not who I am. Like come and, you know, as long as you're not cursing anybody out, you can say what you feel. But over time, it got really exhausting. And Kelsey and I just started saying, hey, if you're just going to come on here and bash marriage and say, don't get married, don't get married, don't get married, don't get married, which is what a lot of them did. Yep. I just said, I, I got to ban you because this is not helpful to my page. So I was so inundated for so long with those folks 
yep. that I just didn't know how, where you all fit in and you're not just you, but you know, all the men that you work with and what your, what your stuff is all about. So um, let's that just start actually, there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Number one, number two, I don't blame you at all for reaching out to Janice or anybody to try to verify who is this guy reaching out to me to speak at a, at a live event in Florida. Um, yeah. The marketing is super polarizing. Like it's not just a little bit polarizing. Uh, I would say it's a little bit more hardcore than MAGA, you know, political stuff. It's yeah. not, it's nothing crazy or anything, but it's, it's pretty intense. It's in the it, same vein, right? It what? It's in the same vein. Yeah. It's, it's in the same vein. Style. I mean, obviously inspired by it. Um, yeah. it. It's not a political movement. It's not a political thing, but it, it very, there's so much going on politically in the country that the minute you associate even remotely with MAGA stuff, it just riles people up. And then of course, you know, with feminism, I, I view feminism as the religion of modern women and as the most dominant ideology in Western civilization, never mind America. So to so basically make women great again is like the union of like everything aggravating about MAGA with everything that would rile up feminists and a huge population of women in America that are living in a very unusual time in history where America has incredible amount of wealth and military power and security policing and stuff. Things that have never really existed in courts and all these things that have never existed from mm-hmm. before in history. So Make Women Great Again was this huge pushback. I view it as the the probably the biggest pushback by far um, from a secular perspective, too, against feminism culturally that we've seen in a long time. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not even political, really. It's this cultural thing when we talk about relationships and self-improvement, uh, the social, you know, marital effects of feminism, uh, all kinds of different issues. I, you know, um, one of the things I'm always struggling with over time, I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years now, is like, what is my mission statement for the companies that I operate? And it's always changing. I try to update it over time and not stay too stagnant. But out of you, you know, one of the core missions of what I do is healing gender relations in the United States and the West. And Make Women Great Again is a push to do that. We hear a lot about race relations, obviously, in America. I'm not like, I don't talk about these issues, but not much anyway, except on my Twitter, maybe. But gender relations is something you don't hear about at all. It makes perfect sense based on our colloquial use of the terms colloquial. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that right. Mm-hmm. And make women great again is a huge push to do that. We do that for men too. We try to teach yeah. them about women, how to be a man. But for women, there's nothing even like that outside of a few authors like yourself, Janice right. Mango, um, Alison Armstrong. Yeah. It's very, I'm, I'm trying to basically unite uh, not only all these mansplainers, these coaches and speakers of, you know, men talking to women. But the the loosely organized group of women who don't like feminism, they're critical of it, and they want to help women be better women. That doesn't exist anywhere right now. There's a, there's nothing really but feminism, uh, feminism and feminism and, light. And that's how I mean that's why when I really got into studying like who you were and what you were about, and and I listened to you. I mean the truth is, Anthony, there's nothing you've said thus far that I've heard that I don't wholeheartedly agree with. That's Thanks. the bottom line. And so after I looked into it you know, I had to separate myself from the bombastic way in which you speak because I said that at the opening. (laughs) I told everybody, we're not going to have too much of um, that cursing on this show, but he does curse a lot. I told them that, you know, your style is very different and it gets attention, of course, and it's very different from mine. But at the end of the day, the message is the same and that's okay to have a different style and it doesn't freak me out. But, um, Oh, you mentioned the manosphere as well. Like, I'm not surprised you've had these issues. Um, the Manosphere is a very diverse movement uh, of men, uh, both in terms of ideologies, as different camps. I view it, a quick explanation is like, I view it as like a circle. And inside this giant circle, the Manosphere that we, or uh, Will Spencer has some good ideas for it too. He says he lives in the suburbs of the Manosphere, or something like downtown. Yeah. That's kind of, that's, that's kind of well, funny. And what I said to my husband about the, your, 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 how loose you are, loose lipped you are. He's like, but that's how men talk to each other. So you have exactly. to understand. He's yeah. with the men talking. But yep. I understand that when you're in front of women, you don't you don't do the same don't don't yeah. um, talk quite the same way. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, it feels natural and it feels appropriate. Um, I don't think it's feminine for women to curse like a sailor. Uh, in private, it's a little bit different, but particularly in public, it's a big no no. Um, but anyway, the manosphere I view is like this kind of circle, and I've shown this. Uh, I visualized this in my speeches. Some of them at twenty one convention for men. It's a big circle. It's a big kind of loose organized thing, almost like feminism, right? This kind mm-hmm. of disorganized movement. But within the manosphere, you have very distinct groups. You have men's rights activists, MRAs, which are very distinct. They've been going for decades, right? Even since the, yeah. let's say, early 80s, Warren Farrell, when he broke off in feminism, Dr. Warren Farrell. You have MGTOW, which is more recent, probably the past 15 years that got going. Okay, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to slow down and have you say, tell, I know what you're saying, but oh, yeah. have 
make sure you you're so yeah, used yeah. to the acronyms that M- yeah. MGTOW means men going their own way. This has been in the mainstream news even the past couple of years. Yeah. Uh, CNN, Fox News, all kinds of stuff. And even authors maybe like yourself are trying to figure out, Helen Smith's a good one too, mm-hmm. like why men go on strike? Why are men exiting the dating marketplace, exiting the marriage marketplace? So there's MGTOW, men going their own way. There's men's rights. There's the old school pickup artists that were famous in the 2000s and early 2010s with the game, the pickup artist TV show on VH1. And then you have the Red Pill. They had their own kind of hybrid, uh, I would say like a, a hybrid uh, of all three of the other ones of MGTOW, which are very friendly with them, you know, seduction or picking up women, pick up artists, and then men's rights. So you have these four different camps. Uh, the Red Pill one kind of got nuked on Reddit recently, along with MGTOW. And that was their main grouping. There was about 300,000 of them that would organize there. So they're having trouble even to kind of uh, continuing to exist at this point. But anyway, the Manosphere, I view, is a very right. positive thing with some bad actors in it. So, both. excuse me, the Manosphere then encompasses all of these four groups. Yes, yes. Get. I would even say there's a new fifth one emerging in recent years that I've been trying to spearhead. And that's like this pro-patriarchy, pro-fatherhood element mm-hmm. that um, you didn't really see outside of men's rights. Uh, and even that was strictly like legal policy issues. So you see this kind of pro-fatherhood, pro-family uh, message getting put into the Manosphere and a lot of my speakers appreciate that, particularly the ones who are Christian and pro- much more pro-family. Because in the Manosphere, which has been going on since at least the 90s, as like an organized, uh, loosely organized movement, there was very little push for pro-family, pro-fatherhood issues. None of that. It was about picking yeah. up chicks, going your own way. Which uh, is a whole different, I mean, or fighting for, for Those don't even have anything in common, the pickups and the fathers. I mean, they're yeah. doing different things well and now if a father got out of a unhealthy marriage that might be there might be an opportunity for him to get back in the dating that's important but a lot of guys are not a lot of men either they're that or they're not and if they're not that they're still married they want to have a better marriage they want to be a better father for their kids um even me like an uncle i'm not a father but i listen to what these the father stuff is because i have nephews now and i want to be Mm -hmm. the best uncle i can for them so who would have thought right but right. So uh, the mission I have for the Manosphere, what I outline it as, is a positive future for men, boys, and fathers. I'm very explicit in that, right? I am have no problem with helping women. Obviously, that's, that's a priority for me with an event I do. But I want to help men, boys, and fathers explicitly and on purpose. And then we could talk about helping women and girls. But we live in a culture also that, uh, you know, that's like uh, beyond normal. I remember being at a hotel we hosted at one of our events at. This is like in 2017, 2018, even a couple years ago. And there was this big card on like the front desk of the hotel and it was about young girls. It can be anything they want and like all this stuff and, you know, donate money to help girls be whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, when's the last time have I seen where little boys can be whatever they want? Like, why isn't, you know, both of this is both. I mean, there's more, uh, you can debate what, you know, the feminist issues behind this and stuff, but ignoring whatever that means long-term, whatever the real implications of that are, it's, it's supposed to be pro girl, pro female. Why mm-hmm. is there nothing for young boys? Why do we not tell them they can be anything they want and be strong and courageous and virtuous and be and, creative and conquer the world? Why don't we do that? And, and of course, you know, you know why that is, you know, yeah. you know, that feminism has taken over in terms of this idea that women mm-hmm. have to uh, have they've been subjugated for so long that it's time to focus exclusively on them to even out the playing field, which the whole yeah. damn narrative is false to begin with. So yep. people have absorbed this and accept it. Or if they don't accept it, they don't know what to do. You know, like if you're standing there yep. with your son, why wouldn't you say? Because I do. You know, my husband does. This is how we've raised our kids. But most people don't. And so th- there is no other place, in my opinion, for the pushback to come except from through parenting. Yeah, I believe that that is the way to counteract the culture. It's the only way because you're not going to get it anywhere else so yeah parenting is huge yeah it's it's huge and it's and it's different from the way that it was when you and i were growing up and it's a taller order for parents they shouldn't have to fight this narrative but they're gonna have to otherwise their kids are going to succumb to it um you know that's another thing that was interesting about when i going back to when i said i agree with everything that you've said um the fact that you're secular the fact that you're coming at it from a secular place as am I is something else that is similar with us and that I have yeah. a lot of Christian followers and I actually uh, grew up, I went to Catholic school. My husband's Catholic. Our kids went to Catholic school. So there's, I'm not in your boat in terms of you just self describe as an atheist, mm-hmm. but the reality is coming at the issues from a secular perspective. That's, yeah. that's the same thing. And that's important to me because 
there's always, first of all, there are plenty of Christians who are doing what they're doing. And if you're in that camp, you've got the coverage there, you know, mm-hmm. secular America doesn't have anything between, well, what if you don't identify with that, but you also don't buy all the feminist crap, where are you going to go? Yeah. And that's really what I'm trying to fill. And I think yep. you are on the male side. Yeah, for sure. There's a huge, there's a huge gap and it's uh, like a vacuum of nothing. Uh, with for girls, it's even more obvious, but for boys too. Also being having a secular platform like my events I build, it, it really opens a wide umbrella for people to interact. Yeah. So there's atheists like myself or objectivists technically. Uh, you have different denominations of Christianity. You sometimes have Jews or even some Muslims attend and stuff. So it's a wide angle lens of, of people who are like pro-masculinity, pro-femininity, pro-family. And they can debate. You know, they don't want to downplay. We had a really cool panel at the end of the event. Unfortunately, missed it. And it was uh, an atheist, Jack Donovan. It was a Mormon, uh, Tanner Guzzi, who are really controversial among other Christians because uh, Joseph Smith and all that. Then you had a uh, evangelical pastor, Michael Foster. Then you had an uh, Orthodox Christian, uh, Jeff Younger, uh, who's famous for fighting for his son with trans issues. So you had like all these, these are really different uh, denominations of Christianity yeah. and atheism and like, but they all got to talk about the differences between what they believe in and then how they can work together for like Jack Donovan was the atheist. And he's like, look, you guys are all Christians. You have very serious differences in what you believe. But at this point, we're trying to argue about how to get out of our house because the government's trying to lock us in our house, or fr- lock the front door in our house. Like that's how mm-hmm. serious things have gotten in this country. Mm-hmm. And the, the muzzles and the mask and the, the, the zombie shots that's, and stuff. That's why I really hate the whole uh, the issues that we deal with family dating, marriage, all of it. Oh, I hate it being labeled conservative. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that I don't vote that way. It's that this is way bigger than that. This is, yeah. there are plenty of feminist conservative women and plenty of non-feminist liberal women, believe it or not. It's really a separate cultural issue about um, the roles of women and men, marriage, family, parenting. It's just so separate. So I can't stand being yeah. typecast in that political way. People, people try to do that to me too. And I'm like, man, I'm not what you think I am. Like yeah. my, pol- my politics are with the founding fathers and Ayn Rand. And that puts yeah. me in a very, you know, serious odds with all neoconservatives, for example, mm-hmm. uh, all the rhinos, but even a lot of like more moderate conservatives. Like, I don't believe what you believe. I'm 100% mm-hmm. in favor of like, you know, Second Amendment, First Amendment, like all the stuff. And they're not, they say they will. But when the push comes to shove, they have like mm-hmm. very... They'll compromise or they, they give up or they sell out or they're whatever they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, automatic well, weapons today. is an easy one. What's that? Automatic weapons is an easy one politically yeah. for me. Like I'm hundred, I don't think the government has any business telling you how many bullets come out of your gun when you pull the trigger one or two or three or whatever. And a lot of conservatives don't get behind that. They're like, well, it's too radical, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what would the founding fathers say? And they'd say you're, you're uh, a coward yeah. to put nicely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, what is the <laughs> polite word? Trying to like? hold your tongue there, but I did. But one more thing on this secular issue. Um, I've t- I talk sometimes about common sense masculinity, common sense femininity, kind of like the founding fathers would. But also from a secular position, uh, and I'm not Christian anyway, but even if I was, I think it's important for Americans to build an American masculinity and an American femininity. And that doesn't exist right now. Uh, no. there isn't, there isn't really, you have old school, you know, Christians do some of the hardcore ones anyway, they'll promote, uh, biblical masculinity and biblical, uh, femininity and stuff. But even that's unusual a lot of the time, unfortunately. But I think this isn't, this is an easy thing. Like we live in America, there's 300 something million people here. Why can't we have our own brand of masculinity and femininity that everyone can, no matter where you're born and what you believe, like, why can't we all push towards that? Like some well, positive element of that. I feel like it can be easily framed between in two camps. And that is whether you truly believe that being male and female is a social construct, which is the narrative that feminists push or anybody in the left pushes, or whether you absolutely believe in human nature and male and female nature. So it's either biology or ideology, which camp are you in? Yeah. And that to me crosses political barriers, barriers and religious barriers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, That's common. really what it needs to be. Biology or ideology? Which which one are you going to go to? Yep. Yeah, we're lost know. as a people. Like we, I'm you know, strongly in favor of the biology camp. Um, you know, when I grew up in the 90s, that was a lot more normal. I'm 33 now. But when I grew up, you know, there was two bathrooms. So we had the whole bathroom system figured out. It wasn't mm-hmm. complicated. Nobody had a problem with it, really. And now we don't even know what bathroom to go to. Like, that's where we're at. 
our culture is falling. We have like all this advanced technology, our phones and space travel and stuff and all this. And we can't even figure out the bathrooms at this point. Like, how pathetic is that? Like, that's how confused and, we and are. And the lots. reason is, in my opinion, the reason is, is because the vast majority of people are too scared to push back against that very, 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 very small minority, yeah. although very loud minority because they have all the power. Yep. Uh, um, in terms of what they know to be true, they, you, they can't. They don't have the courage, you know, or they don't have the numbers behind them and they need more people to help them to to not care. It's very difficult to go against, you know, to go against the norm. And when you do, you're, you're, you know, you get a lot of flack and people just don't want to deal with that, you know? So they like quietly do their thing, which, okay, I get. But on the other hand, guess what? That's why they're successful because you're quiet. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I get a lot of emails and DMs from guys on messages from uh, surgeons and lawyers and doctors and stuff that follow me. They love what I do, uh, whether I knew them growing up or not. You know, some sometimes I grew up and I have friends now who are surgeons and doctors and stuff uh, and PAs and stuff. They love what I do, but they can't openly promote it. They'll tell no. me all day long. No, this is my it. life. Yeah. Yeah. I had one guy who was a PA in Florida and he almost lost his job over sharing one of my Facebook posts. Just he didn't even like comment on it. He just shared it like, uh, you know, the default share and uh, he was pa making six figures and the hospital it was recently purchased by a larger corporate thing which is why he said the hr policy kind of changed but they yanked him into hr and the, all these nurses basically were following him on his facebook and they complain about what i posted and like lee you know i don't say his name but uh obviously but they're like he posted this and uh they're like look you got to delete it or we gotta let you go I mean, that, that's where we're at as a country. This guy is a PA, almost a physician's assistant, almost a doctor. Mm-hmm. He can't mm-hmm. even share something someone else mm-hmm. said without losing his job. Like his whole life is for, yeah. and this to me is really, this is really sick. Like this is controlling what people say, what people yep. think. It's it's controlling like literally what you do with your fingers and your tongue. Yes. Like this is this madness. Uh, yeah. And oh, here's another, here's a great example of that. Those years that I was on Fox News a fair amount. I wrote for them for about five years and I did a lot of Fox news stints and nice. I got just as much flack, not all the time, but a lot of the time from some of the women there. Wow. Right? Yeah. I mean, even though it's considered this conservative channel, um, I can think of only one woman there who was truly unbiased and the others got really upset. And so I dealt with just as much flack there than I would have. It's like CNN. Wow. But I'm bringing it up because prior to getting plugged in, you know, before the, before I'd go live with the host, the Fox producers behind the scene come out, come on in your ear and talk to you to make sure you're all okay. And for several years I had many of them say, we love you, Suzanne. We think you're great. We love everything that you're saying. Wow. Yeah. So I'd have that. And then I go flip. Now I'm on the air and now I got to be attacked by the host. So, so this is interesting because my point is that the people that you're seeing and hearing from, Yep. are one way, but they're actually the minority. So for every one host who's acting that way, there's a hundred people behind the scenes in those control rooms who yep. don't agree and you don't see them. Yeah. I believe this it. Is no doubt that I would deal with over the years that would fuel me even more because I want to be the spokesperson for those quiet people in the control room. Yeah. My voice for the voiceless. Yeah. yeah. It, people do need to speak up a lot more, but uh, it's, I mean, I get it. I mean, it's like, yeah, my buddy, I just told you the story of like, you know, he he basically then had to take all these nurses off of his. He was so angry about it because he really loves what I do. And he was like so aggravated that he had yeah. to do this. He's like, either I delete this post or I lose my job, you know, making over 100 grand a year that he went to school for, medical why, school for and all this stuff. Yeah, It's sick. This is why everything that's happening in the country right now with Biden and the whole just everything is happening is because of that. Yeah, because no, everyone's just being hushed. And it's trying to, it's interesting trying to figure out too where it comes from. Like I'm a big Ayn Rand fan. I'm a big fan of philosophy. So I do think mm-hmm. there's pretty serious philosophic decay in the country. I think that mm-hmm. was occurring before feminism uh, really kicked up about a hundred years ago. I think also feminism is a big, uh, big factor in this. Uh, I was tweeting today about, you know, these spokesmen for the Pentagon. Uh, great example. Oh, he said uh, climate change was, this came out today, is a serious threat as China, the United, future of the United States. And I'm like, man, this is like, Oh serious, my, as serious of a threat as what? As China. Oh my! Like yeah. so, climate change is a, is this theory. Yeah. I don't want to get in the weeds on it, but like this is not a proven thing, and the science is not settled. It's never settled, and it's very complex. Like trying to understand the weather and how we affect it, if at all, and all this Absolutely. stuff. And then China is this major, you know, communist power that killed fifty-four million people not too long ago. Uh, they have an emperor. They call him the president, but he's an emperor. 
And I don't have any problem with Chinese people, but this government that operates the country is genocidal. Uh, historically, the same government. And yeah, it's a very serious threat. And climate change is, is a joke by comparison. Mm-hmm. But why, so why, did a, well, why did a leader get in the Pentagon who says this kind of stuff? I think feminism, as George Carlin would say, has, you know, pussified the American male. Uh, to quote George Carlin and many other comedians and many other uh, commentators yeah. like oh, myself. Absolutely. And and absolutely. It, because that's so what I mean by it. it doesn't even matter what political side you're on anymore. If you've been cowed yeah. by that group, mm-hmm. it, it you just have. It doesn't matter what side you're on. Yeah. I think feminism is basically the attempt to destroy not only masculinity and femininity, but the relationship between men and women mm-hmm. and make everyone weak in their own in their own specific ways through their gender. So for men that's being like a doormat, being weak or you know, even spouting off something like that in the military. For women, I think it's giving into their own vices and bad impulses. Yeah, um, yeah. So definitely agree. Well, let's talk about this because so I heard you say this in a podcast once. I'm going to just quote you, um, sure. and we'll get into the whole feminism thing because this is where it, this is how it happens. You said, "quote Whatever your religion is in America, feminism dominates what they do: school, work, life, relationships, babies, family formation." family formation, dating, it's all dictated by feminism. Yep. And obviously I agree wholeheartedly and I've, I've been, I've been in it. I've been knee deep in it for 20 years. Yep. It's the message that it's the most important aspect of the message to get it away from this idea of all feminist means is women are equal to men, which is an absurd statement and, and make, means absolutely nothing. I thought it was about it, voting. It, I thought feminism it, about voting rights. What happened there? Now it's about equality. Yeah. What is it? Right. Yeah. Right. And so it, it's the whole, most people though, don't understand the scope of how the feminist mon- mentality mm-hmm. or theory or whatever um, infiltrated into the, all those areas that you, that you describe in there, thereby getting people at every, every, in every domain from birth to, you know, adulthood yeah. in their formative years. And you described it really well there, which is why I wanted well, to. Well, even beyond that, I was tweeting the other night about all these single moms today, this epidemic of single motherhood that I think is squarely caused by feminism and its offshoots into politics. Uh, all these single mothers are going to end up single grandmothers. And we're going to have a tidal wave of single grandmothers in the near future in the United States and the West, other Western nations. And that to me is a reflection of how far it's not just from birth to childhood to adulthood. It's going to be in your later years, too. You know, my grandparents, I went to their 50th uh, anniversary when I was like 10 or 12 or whatever. That's not going to happen. Not even close yeah. for most women because they're all single moms in their yep. 30s and 20s and 30s and 40s. Where is that going to end up? You're going to be single. You're not going to have a 50 anniversary. You're not going to have any anniversary when you're in your 70s because you're single. And you've been single for 30 years. And it's not just single moms, but we also of course, have gray divorce, which is a thing now, trend. So that even if um, you stayed married for a long time, you're you're divorced in your, you know, 60 plus years, which means that you would still end up being a single, yeah. as you say, grandmother or grandfather, basically people just living alone, I guess is a better way of putting it. And we yep. are at that stage. We're at a critical point at that yep. with respect to that now. The but, marriage uh, is- but um, on my comment that you're quoting, I think I was directing it at women. It affects men at a, at almost the same level, but I think women are even more affected by it. But I do believe exactly what you, what you're quoting me on that feminism is the most dominant ideology it's basically the religion of modern women. It dictates yeah. all their life, major life choices, way more than anything, even like Christianity, which is amazing. That's a 2000. 2000- even when they don't know it, Anthony, that's, that's the right. scary part. Yep. Even when they don't know it. It's one thing to be a proud feminist and go after that life yeah. and whatever that means for you. It's, it's the people who don't realize that they're living according to those values. Bingo. That's the most insidious and horrible part of this whole conversation. That's right. I completely agree. You know, if, if a girl is an, uh, is a radical or honest or open feminist, that's one issue, but that's a very small percent of the population in Britain. It's yep. like 20% in America. It's probably like 15% or it's yep. really, really low. Yep. Cause very it, low. Cause that has negative connotations with it. R- rightly so, because a lot of them are just crazy and unhinged and they, they scream, kill all men and all kinds of stupid stuff. But yeah, it's, it's the offshoots into the rest of the culture that are massive, massive, massive. It, the military is dominated by feminism. The governments are dominated. Most governments are dominated by feminism. The entire federal government is dominated by feminism. Most state governments, most local governments, all your schools, all your universities, most of your, most of your churches, the courts, all the statutes, the laws, uh, legal precedent, all this stuff is feminism, feminism. We're drowning in feminism. The country is going to, I think feminism, either one of two things is going to die this century, America or feminism. 
that that's where this is going. The, these two things are completely at odds with each other. They don't work. They are. This is the this is are. the antithesis of our founding, and it's the antithesis of living in a free and rational society where men are men and women are women, and we live in a free and open society where we can talk and debate and uh, work out the issues and stuff. Feminism is antagonistic to all that, even free speech. I mean, are feminists in favor of free speech or against it? They're against it. They bully people and they pr- promote all this dogma. That's why I was making fun of them with our marketing. Uh, some of the blaze, uh, some of the Chad, the Chad guy was talking about it. They were quoting us in the New York Post. How we talk about toxic bullying feminist dogma because they're all bullies who want to bully you and silence you rather than have a debate and admit that they're wrong on anything. How do you answer? Have you had people? I mean, have you ever come up with a, like a really clean, simple answer that doesn't go off on a tangent as to when you know when the woman, when a, the average person says to you? But all feminism means is equal rights for women. Why would you be against that? I've actually talked about this in my speeches several times. Uh, it's a really good one. So basically, there's four main ways, if I can quote myself correctly here, having worked this out previously for speeches. Uh, so you're saying equal rights is what feminism is, right? But equal rights is... Saying what? You said feminism is about equal rights. That's the hypothetical you're promoting here? Correct. Yeah. Well, what about equality? I mean, are you only in favor of equal rights? What about equality between men and women beyond equal rights? So now, but that's what feminism is, Anthony. That's what it is about equality between men and women. That's not what you said. You said equal rights. So now it's two things. Now it's political equal rights. Now What's the difference? Well, equal, equality goes well beyond equal rights. What about equality in a relationship? Are we equal in a relationship? That's not a political issue, right? That's not, there's no law for that uh, for the most part, right? Well, I don't believe in equality between men and women, right? I think women like men who are stronger and superior to them in so many ways. So now you have equal rights, you have equality. What about women's empowerment? You're not in favor of women's empowerment. I thought feminism is about women's empowerment, right? So you have at least three things now operating at the same time. You have fem- you know, female empowerment. You have women's, uh, what about women's rights? You're in favor of equal rights. You want equal rights for men too, but you're not in favor of equal rights for men. So now you have women's rights, equal rights, equality, and women's empowerment. Now you have this this four, this four quadrant of four different issues that are all very different. So I mean, equal rights and equality would be the closest related, but even that's significantly different. Female empowerment is not necessarily equal rights. That's helping little girls be whatever they want to be, right? Giving them money and it's a welfare for single moms and all this stuff, right? So it's a very, you know, these people are master manipulators. And they're, Ayn Rand called this package dealing. They sell you one thing and they package it hidden, you know, secret with all this other crap in it. And a lot of it ends up being Marxism and communism and like really just bizarre anti-biology, anti-science stuff, like now the bathroom problems we have. and Yeah. And they do it by controlling the language. So two yeah. words that you just used in there are, and this, this is always the question I always have to ask when, when they bring it up is, it depends on what you mean by equality. What's your definition, which is basically what you were just saying. Yeah. What, what is your definition of equality? Same goes for the word empowerment. Yep. Well, what do you mean by empowerment? Because equality and empowerment on their own are great words, but they've been completely demolished because they're now associated with quote unquote women's rights. So you have to ask them, what do you mean by equality? If I define equal, you know, I open this program with where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. That's the tagline for this show. Mm-hmm. So equal in value or equal like in as in the same as in they are interchangeable and of course that the latter is exactly what they've been pushing for for decades yeah. and why there are so many problems between women and men and why marriage has fallen away and why yeah. they can't even get together dating wise because the moment you think of them as interchangeable or the same which is the equality that they mean yeah all bets are off it's over christina hoff summers so there actually, is no such thing she i agree and christina hoff summers you probably know her obviously she has a great uh i don't uh equity versus Equity, Equity feminism yeah, but she also, calls it, feminism. she also calls it symmetrical. And it's really what they're after, making uh, men and women symmetrical or identical, which is, you know, yeah. retarded. Like, this is bizarre. Right. It's totally anti-science, anti-biology, anti-common sense. Like, men and women are, are significantly, substantially, fundamentally different. Physically, yeah. psychologically, your whole life, like, all of it. And if you don't, if you're fighting that your whole life, you are never going to find, you're never going to have a relationship. It's never going to work. That's right. You're, fan, you're not, you're, you're going to be alone. Yep. If you, if you believe if you don't believe that. And of course the average woman today doesn't believe that and doesn't even know she doesn't believe it. Yep. If you put her in paint her into a corner, you know, she'll be like, uh, uh, you know, she'll just sort of stumble over herself because she knows what she's supposed to say and what she can't make sense of. The brainwashing is total. Like it's really serious stuff. It's probably, it's hardcore propaganda. 
that will make you miserable and ruin your life. I mean, yep. what you can tr- debate about the origins of it and who's behind pulling the strings, all who cares, right? What, what matters is that like you can take a hundred million or I don't know, a hundred million, but 25 million young women in their twenties. And most of them believe the same feminist garbage that's going to ruin their life. They're going to go, you know, uh, hoe it up on Tinder. They're going to bang all these guys. They're going to get the heart broken by, you know, 15 different guys named Chad. And then they're going to hit the wall at 29, 30. They're going to be crying in tears. They're going to be angry. They're going to be bitter. They're going to go through a couple plan B's to go through an abortion and try to find some nice guy to settle down. It's not going to work because they've had this, they have this entitlement from hooking up with all these guys, you know, one night stands. Like it's just, it's just a train wreck and it's really it sad. Is. And I think women in particular have a really hard time recovering from trauma. Men do as well, but men can also harden from it and become more masculine. Women, I think, in the manosphere, we have the saying that masculinity is built, femininity is uh, preserved and retained. So it's not really, you can basically at best get it back to baseline, whereas men can build or be destroyed and become total total douchebags. But end rant. I know you love Anne Rant. It'll be happy to know that I was really into her in college, by the way. Loved mm-hmm. it. Loved oh, I said yeah, uh, end, no, end long rant. Time but I love Anne What's rant. that? I said end rant. Uh, oh, but I love Ayn Rand. Oh. I love Ayn Rand very, very much. I know you do. And I've been meaning to tell you that I loved her too in college. I was so into her. Yeah. Um, it's been a long time since I've read that though. So I can't do any quoting hmm. like you probably can. Um, yeah. So, and then actually the sad thing is that's when I, by the way, in my coaching, that's really when I, that's when they call me is what you just said 10 years down the line. Yep. And it's hard. I mean, it's legitimately hard because on the one hand, with what I do, I'm sort of stuck in a place where you need to pretty much be around the age of 30 to receive what I'm telling you, if, you know, to like be ready to hear it. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, that's not the ideal time to hear it. Right. And so then, then you go, okay, I want to go down to the 22 year olds, right. Or the 20 year olds or the 18 year olds even, but they're, but then they're not, Yes, that's the best time to get them, but they're not ready to hear it. Yep. So it's a real problem because I'm right. fighting against this much larger um, thing that that they're getting bombarded with, and when everybody else is around, everybody else around is doing it. It's it's just really hard for them to. They want to, but yeah, it's just it's not fun. It's just a hard, hard thing. So that's interesting you bring Sad. this up because. Uh, you know, one of the main missions of 22 convention is to make it's to make, to make women great again. Right. That's, that's its fundamental purpose. That's in the, it's in the name and it's, I mean it like we need to do that. So, but I never expected from day one, even we've done it twice now for two years, right. We just did the second one with you and many others at it. Um, I never thought we'd get a lot of young women to it. And I don't think it's possible or desirable. I don't really care. I didn't hear that. You, you don't, uh, you didn't think you were going to get what young woman at the event. Oh, yeah, there's just no way. Oh, you thought they'd be older. Yeah, so I'm not, you know, I'm not really worried about who attends it. What I want to do is film it, so we can film your right. speeches to reach younger women. That's the only way. There's no way to get 18 year old girls out to Agreed. a conference. You got to be kidding me for three days. No, it's not going to happen. No, no. But they're on YouTube and they're on Instagram and TikTok and stuff, and our videos can reach them there over years and years and years. It's going to take years and decades to fix this problem. It's a mess. It's a huge mess. Michael Foster, the pastor, who spoke at the events. Uh, you met him probably at the events. He said that basically, you know, this is a generational problem. Like mm-hmm. women, young girls today at 15, 20, 25, they've been brainwashed and fed this whole line of feminist thinking that dominates really what they believe and what they're going to do. And to turn this around, Absolutely. you'll make this, you'll have success in small bits as a, as a coach, you know, one at a time, you know, for women who want that kind of information. But for the most part, you have to reach millions of women and start educating young ones as best you can. Only way to do that's video and audio to an extent, podcasts and yep. stuff. For sure. Actually, I'm, um, I haven't mentioned this to anybody yet on my podcast. I haven't announced it yet, but I'm in the middle of creating online courses for that exact reason. Nice. So that instead of just going one by one with the coaching, there will be a whole course where people can access all over the world. Yep. yep. And it's going to be in video form and you know, you know how online courses go. So that's a lot. It's a big project. So, nice. um, sometime in, sometime in 2022, but, and, and, and again, most, let me, let's, be honest, most of my clients are already married. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So what I'm dealing with there is, is more like saving and helping t- t- saving the marriages and helping them be, um, healthier, wrong, right. Healthier and strong 
as opposed to trying to tell you when you're 22 or 23, how, how to build a life. It's just, it's, I mean, I want to do it all, but I can't do it all. Yeah. Um, so right now that's, that's where my focus seems to be. But at any rate, um, and I feel like this country is kind of divided up into two groups, people who get what we're talking about exactly. Like they're in, they are tuned in, they're dialed in and people who have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. Yeah. And I was reminded of this the other day when I was having coffee with, a woman I know, and I was telling her, um, I offhandedly mentioned how men and boys were falling behind in our society and that they're not going to college at nearly the same rate as women, what a problem this is for relationships and marriage and families. She genuinely had no idea. Yep. And she's not dumb. That's not, that's not my point. She's actually quite the opposite, but just, just simply tuned into other things Yeah. to the point. So if somebody like that, who's tuned in, but busy, isn't even aware of, of this. I, it was almost, it just took me aback because I'm so involved in it. I can't imagine not knowing. Yeah. So I have to stop and remember, wait, the average person may not even know this. I have the same, that the same, me. I, have, I know the experience. Yeah. I've been doing yeah. what I do for so long. Um, when I call them normies, they just don't, they have no idea. They still, they, they eat McDonald's. They just do random stuff. They pay a little bit of attention to news and stuff. They have no idea about these other very serious cultural issues. They're not tuned in at all. They're genuinely ignorant. They're not stupid, usually. Sometimes uh, they're stupid. Uh, exactly. But. And they don't even realize how that's affecting their ability to to, find, yeah. to to create families and find them a good man or how that trickles down to them. And it has to be explained to them. Like, why does this matter to me? Yeah. I remember uh, oh. I met a girl once who was in her late 20s, and she didn't even know. She had a brother and a father and uh, I think a sister, too. I don't, I don't remember, but a couple years ago. But she had no idea that uh, men in this country were subject to selective service, to a draft. Had absolutely no idea. Like, And she was in her late 20s, born in America, raised in Florida like me. And just had no idea that men could get drafted. Her brother, you know, and me when I was younger, my little brother, could get drafted into the military against the will. And you have to go fight in a war and die. Uh, like Vietnam or, you know, anything else. Uh, you know, it's the last time they made a draft. But the selective service is still a thing. And it recently yes, has been some change on it. I, 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 I'm pausing because I'm thinking to try to give her the benefit of the doubt. I guess it's because she's never experienced a war. Yeah, she um, she was a little bit younger than where me, but people were drafted, right? How? Yeah, I mean, like you know, my it, there hasn't been a draft since uh, since Vietnam, right? But, so it's like never been in the news, and so it's just never. I, I don't know, crossed her mind somehow. Yeah, well, it made me think. Now this is just a theory, but I think most millennial women, uh, particularly if they've been the loosely feminist ones, they don't really know they're feminists. But that, that's what mm -hmm. made me think of. It's like this girl, she's probably reflective of most young American women. They have no idea that men are subject to select to the to a draft. They have no idea. They just don't know. They have, they have a brother. They still don't know. You know, and mm -hmm. so this is, it was just shocking. Like, how did you not know that? And I'm like, yeah. because people don't know a lot is the reality of it. Yeah. And it's it's unfortunate and sad, but uh, that's kind of the case. And I think that has real implications for voting. And I, I, one of the things I've said, and I'll say it again, is that everything feminism has done even, even, you know, if you want to argue it's positive, everything they've done has been done in the dumbest way possible. All of it. The worst, dumbest way possible. Mm -hmm. Women getting the vote without being subject to a draft is point and cut, uh, you know, cut and dry. That's, it's mm -hmm. unequal. It's overtly mm -hmm. unequal, explicitly unequal. Mm -hmm. It's been that way since day one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's terrible. It's, it's horrible. I think it, it shifts voting patterns because women are not on the hook. They're not, they don't have skin in the game. If they vote in a presidential election, for example, that typically is, you know, you have a pro-war candidate and an anti-war candidate. Well, they ain't going to war no matter what. And they never have been a threat of going to war. And this this influences how people think and how they vote, right? Uh, I know that I have a little brother and I have nephews now. And if, when I vote in elections, I'm worried about if they're going to get drafted, go to war someday. Because I don't want them to go. I don't, you know, this is, so it's an issue. Mm -hmm. But also I said, um, I should have, it's funny, I had a meme made once for it for this the presentation, 2018, my speech, the future is still masculine, I called it. And I mm -hmm. said that women getting the right to vote in America when they got that in 1918, uh, it was the death of equality, the death of it, not the birth of it, the death. It was a death of equality between rights and responsibilities. Up to that point, there was this balance. And a lot of women didn't want the vote because they thought, rightly so, that they yeah. would get drafted. And they're like, I don't want to get screw voting. I don't want to get drafted. Because to that, to them, the, there was this like uh, just equality. Mm -hmm. you're, gonna, mm -hmm. you're gonna go fight and die against your will. Well, you get to vote on the commander in chief, you get to vote on Congress who decides that the country goes to war. And that's how a lot of women opposed it back then. Cause they're like, I don't want to do that. They even had, there were some States back then that even had that. I think got to figure out which ones, but I know I'm getting off in the weeds on it, but well, I mean, we're way beyond that now, but yeah. So, 
Okay, so t- first, good. let's back up a little bit and tell people because you've mentioned a few times, and I don't know that we've described it. What is your so your website is twenty one studios dot com? I got a million of right? them, but that's, that. that's the main one. Yeah. Okay, so what is the twenty one convention and twenty one university? Sure. And then and then the twenty two, Rick, because yeah. you know you had to explain that to me when I came in. Well, we got the patriarch convention too now for fathers, so we have three events that we run or four technically because twenty one summit is like an umbrella event that has multiple conventions in it. And where'd 21 come from? Well, let's begin from the start. Long, yeah. long ago in Orlando, yeah. Florida. Fif- when you were 17 years old. Yeah, I was 17. I was very young, 15 years ago now. So basically, 21 Studios is the company I run, and it's kind of an umbrella for different conventions that I operate and podcasts and brands. The University, the Redman Group, the Patriarch Convention, the 21 Convention, the 22 Convention, the Under 21 Convention. So let's wind the clock back to the very origin. You mentioned where did 21 come from? I get this question a lot. It came from the original name of the original event, the Under 21 Convention, which is not even supposed to be a convention. It's supposed to be a meetup group. It was called Under Tw- The actual thread I made was uh, organizing this and announcing it was called an Under 21 Meetup. So Under 21 Meetup. And quickly, some people suggested getting a hotel room, conference room and stuff. And then someone's like, yeah, it's going to be an, an Under 21 Convention. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds pretty sharp. So anyway, the name of 21 Studios and the 21 Convention and even the 22, which branched off from 21, uh, that comes from the under 21 Convention, which was, uh, I was in the pickup artist community at that time, that wing of the Manosphere. Uh, There's only one I was familiar with at that point, familiar with. And it was basically a meetup group for young men in that space. They were neglected as a, as a demographic. No one cared. I mean, if you're, these companies back then were making huge amounts of money in that industry millions of dollars a year sometimes in ebooks and courses and boot camps. These boot camps would cost like three thousand dollars for a weekend, like all this stuff. And you know, 18 year old kids have no money. I mean, you're broke. You're a high school kid or a college kid, you got nothing. And when in high school, me and my buddy had to split an ebook uh for the mystery method ebook. It was like ninety seven dollars and we had to split it in half and we could barely afford it because we had like no money. We were kids. Mm-hmm. So I got to college, I was still 17, just out of high school. And I thought about, I wanted to basically meet other guys in the in the in that wing of the Manosphere and the pickup artist community because I thought it would help me get better with women. And I thought I could probably teach some guys too that were terrible. I was still terrible with women at that point, but I could at least get phone numbers and approach and some basic stuff, which for a guy who's had like, you know, who's a virgin and has zero social skills, that's like lightning to him. That's like night and day. And if you can teach him how to get a make out at a bar with some girl, right? He's like, oh my God, I'm like, Life, it's life-changing for these guys because they, they physically mm-hmm. can't do these things. So I wanted to meet other guys who hopefully were better than me. And even if they weren't, that's fine. You know, it'd be a mix of people. And about one year later, in July 2007 at that point, I announced it in July 2006. The event took place in Orlando at the same hotel you were at, actually. It was a different ownership back then. We've been to many hotels since then. But it got going. And we had some major speakers come out to it. So we had about 80 guys show up. It was pretty big. And I uh, made a hundred bucks for, uh, you know, 12, 12 months worth <laughs> yeah. of work, which is pretty good. A lot of people lose money <laughs> first year of business. Yeah. But it was just a hobby project. It wasn't supposed to be a business that it is now. Um, I didn't even mm-hmm. plan to do a second one. So the attendees at the end of the first one, the, the young guys, mostly it was the guys. There was a lot of guys who were teenagers like me, but a lot of guys in their late 20s, even 30s and stuff. One guy was there like in his 50s, you know, was kind of interested in the speakers and stuff. So it's always been a mix, but it was pretty young back then, obviously. That was the focus. But the attendees, two of them came up and asked me, like buddies or something, like, hey, when's the next one? I want to go to the next one. They just assumed it was like a business that I was doing and repeating events. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, uh, next year, same time. <laughs> I just kind of blurted it out because I was so nervous. Uh-huh. You know, still, uh-huh. that was my first time public speaking. The first time uh-huh. I did any public speaking was at my own event in front of like 80 people. It was terrifying. I opened the whole event. I have the video. I mean, I'm like, I bet. yeah, talking. That's impressive. Thanks. Especially since you said you were shy. Yeah. Time. Was, Higher, shy. Well, at that point, Whatever. at that point, I had done a lot of cold approaching um, at bars and stuff and the beaches and malls. So I'd probably done like, I mean, I was like a machine back then. I probably done like 600, 700 approaches or something like that, maybe more. Um, at this point in my life, I've approached like 6,000, over 6,000 women. Uh, even, you know, for that, a lot of that was before 2012. For years, I would just go out, you know, a couple of nights a week, even every night sometimes, just talk to like dozens and dozens of people, as many as I could. And the point was, does this get more comfortable with that? Because before you weren't? Yeah, that was the point. You're supposed to, they call it a newbie mission back then. That was the official like name for it. And they would tell guys if they were terrible with women, like go talk to 500 women. It's going to take you six hmm. months or a year. 
or longer to get comfortable, to get, okay. but it makes you a lot more comfortable because you desensitize to it and you've, you know, you've repeated this yeah. process so many times. Yeah. Anything you do often enough, right. Yeah. You're going to get more comfortable with yeah. it for sure. Okay. So when did, so you kept the 21, yeah. even though you're way over 21 now. Well, so a couple of years later in 2009, I was early 2009, I think it was, I was like, what do I, what do I call this event? Because I'm becoming, I'm assuming going to be over 21. I was 20 at that point. And I was like, crap, what am I going to do? And I thought about calling it the under and over 21 convention, which is just terrible. It sounded like vomit, word vomit, right? I'm like, I can't do that. That's just, I mean, it works, but it's horrible, right? Mm -hmm. So I was reading, uh, the name change actually came from a little bit Tim Ferriss, uh, author, but mostly Seth Godin, another author, writes different, you know, productivity and books Mm -hmm. or whatever. And it was a book called The Purple Cow. And it was about being, we're making a remarkable company. What makes them remarkable? And I knew that the 21, basically that book encouraged me to really keep the 21, not lose it. And the influence of Tim Ferriss is to simplify it. And so I had the idea to just chop the under out and I wrote it, the 21 convention. convention. I was like, good enough, man. That's like clean, simple. It's, uh, it makes people curious. They ask if it's like a blackjack convention, stuff like that a lot. Yeah. So, so the reference of the 21 convention is the one is the annual gathering that yeah. I was just at. Well, and then the 21, 21 summit is the new annual gathering that includes the 21 convention and the 22 convention for women and the patriarch convention for men or for fathers. Okay. Oh my God. So we keep, yeah. we keep branching it out and making more events, yeah. but the main event that's most famous is 21 convention. And that's for men, you know? So once I chopped out the under, I made it for all men over 18. And that's, okay. that was the explicit focus um, I took a tagline from Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, um, some of the marketing. And one of the taglines I still use, it's actually in the background uh, over here. It says, a panorama event for life on earth as a man, free to the world. And that's a bit of a mouthful. But basically, it's a comprehensive event for men over 18, all men uh, mm-hmm. in America and around the world. We've done international events, too, in Poland, Sweden, mm-hmm. England, Australia, all kinds of stuff. I've been really busy the past 15 years. Yes, you have. My goodness. Yeah. It's not like you have a day job. This is the job, yeah, right? This is the job. Since 2000, 2010, I took it full time. Yeah. I dropped out of college. I was four years in. I failed uh, I failed how to start a business twice in a row. You should, <laughs> only, great. only class I've ever failed. And I was the only student both semesters to actually own a business. And I was in the school paper repeatedly for it. And I failed how to start a business twice in a row. And I'm like, this, that is, so fun. this is a sign. That is funny. Yeah. Yeah, very Steve Jobsy or Bill. A lot of famous billionaires. I'm not a billionaire, but uh, a lot of famous entrepreneurs have been like that. They just don't. Yeah, absolutely. And I had no problem with the class. I just couldn't focus because I was always thinking about my own business because I loved it. Yeah. It wasn't just yeah. you know a business. It was like it began there's as talking about it and then there's doing it. Yeah. You just wanted to do it. Yeah, I just want to do it. Yeah, exactly. You never talk about yeah. it. Um, okay, so who? I'm okay. So this is going to seem like it comes out of nowhere, but. It came from your site, so it's not really out of nowhere. So who or what is the ideal man? Oh, yeah, it's good. A lot of that comes from my <laughs> rent. I don't use that terminology much these days. I did from about 2010 to 2016. Um, okay. But it's a vision of Ayn Rand. And that, that to me is just being the best man that you can be by your own design and your own authorship. Authoring, be the author of your own life. So it's not... Unli- it's not uh, boundaryless or borderless it doesn't mean you should be you can be irrational that's going to make you the best man you can be nonsense um if i was an objectivist i'm a firm believer in objective reality uh i believe that nature to be commanded is to be obeyed like you're talking about for women and feminism it's Mm anti-nature it's Mm anti-feminine it's Mm -hmm. anti-female and then for the men it's the same thing right so it's to be that man is to be the best man that you can be by your own design over a lifetime and it's something that you never really achieve, but you should always uh, push for and strive for. And it doesn't mean to be perfect. That's stupid. Nobody's perfect. No one's ever been perfect. No one's ever going to be perfect. Uh, but it's it's the goal to always maximize and push out as far as you can in every domain of life. And then to check yourself too. And to make sure you're the one making the choices and you're not being uh, manipulated or undu- coerced, coerced yes. or unduly influenced in ways you don't realize. Like with feminism being a, yeah. a, a, a and- sort of religion. And I guess that's, I mean, that's literally what I teach. What I've been doing for years is, is teaching people to think for themselves yes. and to listen to their gut and to follow um, nature, yeah. not ideology. And that's, but, but, but my focus has been on women and okay. So you, so you took that concept basically and wanted to broaden out for women as well. Right. Which is where you're make, women great again yes. slogan 
came into being and well, that was so that was 2018 right uh i announced it i announced it in late 2018 however we own the 22 convention domain since 2015 excuse me so basically the 21 i realized over time it looked kind of like it reminded me of the xy chromosome set for men you know it's there's some some basic <laughs> yeah. uh you know similarity here so i realized if i could do people had asked me for years to do a women's convention not a lot but every couple of months i would see something on youtube or facebook or something and i was like yeah i should do a women's convention someday because people keep asking for it but there was no like fire on my belly, so to speak. There was no impetus to really do it or, you know, ma- no major impulse to it's a hassle setting up a new convention, marketing it, promoting it, building it, the speakers, the lineup, the content, you know, what am I going to do with this? So I lacked that fire because I lacked a mission for it. I, re- I knew I didn't have it. And the minute I, I figured out make women great again, the minute I saw, I saw a hat that was similar to what the one I have now, like loosely similar. And I fell in love with it immediately. Let me just pause really quick because people who don't know this. So he he has the red hat that Trump had with Mer- Make America Great Again. Oh, yeah. It says Make Women Great Again. On. So a lot of people, I have to visualize it I, to know. I know, got a lot of, I got like 40 of them now. We got Make Women yeah. Cook Again, Make Women Fertile Again, Make Women Virgins Again, Make Women Breed Again, Make Women Mothers Again. Now you can see the difference between you're trying to do this and my trying to do this, yeah, right? Yeah. That's the thing. Like people who always ask me about men, I'm like, well, I feel like men need to talk to men and women need to talk to women. Because I just feel like it lands better when it's coming from your own sex. Uh, so somewhat. that I mean, depending on who you're talking to. So, I mean, there are two ways of looking at that. You could say, well, wouldn't you want to hear from the men? Because they're the ones who you're trying to attract, yeah. right? So they should know yep. what they're looking for. So there's that end of it. And then there's, you know, me as a woman telling a younger woman, this is... Um, this is not how to be a woman that this was probably going to benefit you more yeah. if, if this is your, no, I want to, I want to make it clear. I think it's extremely important for older women to mentor younger women. And that like for men has been killed off in this country. Uh, yeah. for men, for example, there's a, a real, you know, fatherlessness is a huge issue, right? Uh, the court system and feminism and all this, the culture are making buffoons, media and TV out of fathers. Everybody's mm-hmm. Homer Simpson mm-hmm. now to some loser doofus mm-hmm. at best. That's mm-hmm. terrible for men, and they need strong fathers who have real influence. Not just fathers, but uncles and grandfathers and cousins, you know, like big brothers. Like, this mm-hmm. is really important. Young women need that, too. I think they also need good mansplaining, and that's the real purpose of the mansplaining term. Yeah. As funny as it is to play with, they use it. Um, they mean it when they say it. They try- yeah. It's to silence you. It's to cut off and to neuter mm-hmm. masculine voices in the West and in America. So that fathers don't mansplain to their daughters. So that uncles and grandfathers don't have a say and an influence in a young girl's life, right? And those girls are then on top of that. Not only is he mansplaining, they're told to like cut him out and not even seek advice in the first place, right? On dating and building a family and going to going to school or not. When should I go to school? Like career, like all this stuff. So that's terrible. And women, they need both. Yep. They need to hear from women and then uh, probably not their peers so much as older women. And um, like, you you know, yourself and Janice Fiamengo and all these women, Camille Pagula is another great one. Uh, Christina mm-hmm. Summers is okay. Me and her have gone back on back and forth on Twitter a little bit. She's she's too pro feminist for me, and I don't like that mm-hmm. at all. Uh, yeah. I think she needs to abandon her. She's trying to like save feminism. Like you could just just Agreed. forget it. Uh, agree. Throw in the trash, and burn it. Like throw a match on it. <laughs> yeah. We are not like minded in that respect, but there's but yeah. she's done so much wonderful good that I just focus on. She that. does. She does do but, a lot of good. Um, I can't deny that. I don't think it's salvageable at all. I think that's a waste of time. Um, it's too far gone. But. Well, on that point, though, I want to make it known that I'm uh, I'm considered the president of the Manosphere. This is a self-appointed title. Mm-hmm. It was a big de- deal in 2019 when I started it. The media, as I thought, would pick it up, and they have you know gone after it too. So the man, the reason there's a couple reasons I did that, but one of the main reasons is that I get concerned sometimes that the Manosphere will get uh, collapse into this toxic sludge like feminism is. And I wonder yeah. sometimes how did feminism get so crazy and so radical and so vicious? And it didn't happen overnight. It took a long time. And it took enough. It took people not speaking up and keeping an eye on the movement and, and steering it in a healthy, mm-hmm. positive direction. So for them, it just went downhill over time till it got. It's super crazy now. I mean, we don't even have radical feminism. I call it like hyper radical feminism. It's completely unhinged. And totally unhinged. Like like, like I said, we can't even figure out the bathroom. Like that's where we're at as a people. That's what feminism has done. We don't even know what bathroom to go to. You know, Jeff Younger, my friend and one of our speakers, is trying to prevent his son from being transitioned into a girl. And the mother is a pediatrician in Texas. It's all over the news. I know this story. Yeah. I do know this story. He spoke at 22 and 21. The 22 ad was the last minute. The woman really? requested him. He spoke at the fatherhood event, excuse me, the patriarch event. 
Oh. But it's sick. I mean, okay. it's like, how is this even possible? And feminism is what makes it possible. Yes. Oh, no question. Yep. So tell everyone what happened last year with Good Morning Britain when you introduced the May <laughs> Women Great Again slogan. But let's pause for a minute, take a quick listen. Are you going to teach us at this concept. convention, Anthony Dream Johnson? What, what will I learn if I pay my $999 to turn up and be uh, talked to by yeah. men about how to be a good woman? Because I think I might need Yeah, some so the tips. 22 convention. <laughs> yeah, come on out. Have a good time. It'll be a great time. So the 22 convention is the mansplaining event of the century. That's its destiny. It's coming up soon in Orlando, Florida this May. And I'm only one of the speakers. I'm actually more like Obama, like a community organizer. And I'm organizing about 20 speakers to put together. And they're the top mansplainers in the world. I've been doing that my entire life. So tell me what so you mansplained to me. Over 13 years. I'm quite an expert at being mansplained to you. So just, just tell me what you teach me. My speech... So, well, look, Piers is a fantastic mansplainer. You're, You're in good right. company. <laughs> yeah. uh, my speech at the convention, one of about 20, so I'm just one of 20 speakers at the event, yeah. is going to be on motherhood first. Right. And I believe that feminists, when they present a choice to women between career and motherhood, it's a fake choice. It's not real because okay. they're pushing an agenda behind it to push them to delay motherhood. And I think okay, most women, hang not all hang women, on, most hang on, women hang on, hang on, be happier I'm not, I'm not, I can't turn up to your. I can't turn up to your lecture. I'm a mother with a successful career. I'm very happy for you. That's wonderful. I think right. you made a great choice. I think motherhood is awesome. I mean, you should have as many babies as you want yeah. and not get bullied by feminists for it. No, but I am Which a many of them do now. There are women stuck out for me by anybody. I had as many children as I wanted, and I've got a career, so I'm not sure what you're... You, you might are you be telling confused. me that was wrong? I, I think feminism, as, as Pier, Piers has been discussing here or hinting at, I think feminism has collapsed into rampant, sexist, man-hating bigotry and female supremacism. I don't hate That's any That's what these men. hashtags mean. Toxic masculinity, the future is female... I'm not female. Where's my future? So, so how, what was that like, Anthony? It was awesome. I actually, uh, I had other TV uh, interview invites from like local Fox News and stuff like that. And I turned them down. Uh, I don't have any hatred of local news, but I, re I really wanted to make sure that my first TV appearance was a major one. And I figured if I waited and I was patient that I would get one. And sure, sure as hell, I got one. And, you know, it was, you could say shit, sure, Anthony. Yeah. You could say shit. Sure. Okay. You wanted to say shit. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, I knew who Piers Morgan was. I mean, he's interviewed presidents and Supreme Court justices. I mean, he's a major yeah. news personality. Mm -hmm. I wasn't too familiar with Good Morning Britain a little bit. Um, I've seen some of our speakers have been on there before, pickup artists and stuff. And they, of course, got the same kind of fights. They love drama. It's a morning show. Piers Morgan is known to do this kind of stuff. But no, mm -hmm. I loved it. Um, they picked me up in a Tesla like four or three in the morning to go to the... So it was really late at night, mm -hmm. too. People don't realize that. Like, No, I didn't know that. Well, I guess it would be. Because it's Britain, yeah. Morning there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Janice, it wasn't too bad because she's on the west coast of Canada, I think. Uh, so mm -hmm. It was late for her, but it was like, I don't know, midnight or something. For me, it was like 3.30 yeah. in the morning by the time I was live. So, At least you don't have to do makeup. Yeah, 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 I don't do makeup, yeah. But um, yeah, so it was late and I was like, I took a nap, you know, I couldn't get to sleep, you know, in time. I took a shower, I had a little bit of coffee, but I was just like so out of it. And when I get tired, I, I tried to be as focused as I could, obviously, for the show. But when I get tired, I get like super savage i just drop i have very few filters anyway like it's, it's yeah. really difficult to not curse for example i'm like really like <laughs> slowly going through what i'm gonna say right but if the, once right. they made me mad i was like nah i'm, I'm done like screw these people man great. thanks you did great you look like you'd been doing it for a long time yeah well speaking i think is what helped and you know talk you know one of our speakers was uh he asked me uh one of the christian guys he's like how did you you know get so he was very happy with how I did. And he was very concerned that it would not, mm -hmm. he was concerned it wouldn't go so yeah. well. Right. And I get that. They chew you up. They chew me up and that I would up. be too bombastic and curse and get kicked yeah. off or something, which just happens. Oh, yeah. um, but that didn't happen. They, they, they invited me back on. I almost went on uh, a few months after that, you know, later in the year. And then like the last, like that, they, they canceled it like the day before. Cause they had someone else who knows, right. All scheduling yeah. crap. But um, it was awesome. And he asked me, though, he's like, how did you do so well with it? And I'm like, well, I had a few zingers that I had rehearsed. I knew I wanted things I wanted to say. Who cares what they're going to ask me? I just mm -hmm. want to say these things. For example, I called mm -hmm. feminism a national security threat. And I meant that. And I'm serious. Mm -hmm. It's not like climate change. It's very mm -hmm. real. Uh, and it's very obvious with things like military standards, for example. That's just like a that's just like elementary mm -hmm. uh, level issue with it. But mm -hmm. it's real. And look at other nations, you know, look at, look at our, look at our marketing for our military that, that the commercials they put out versus ones from Russia and stuff. You gotta be kidding me. Like we're promoting the CIA is promoting now, like, uh, LGBTQ crap, alphabet crap. Yeah, like, right. It's just, oh it's insane. God. Like the, 
whether, you know, the CIA is not military, but these organizations should be very serious and have very serious missions and not be promoting like alphabet soup stuff, just made up nonsense to these people, right? The military, for example, should, oh, I don't want to get into it, but anyway. Well, no, it's a real concern about our military yeah, yeah. and 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 what's going to happen. But, with, or what is the thing but I think also what helped me with the interview is just talking to thousands and thousands of, you know, women at bars who are of attitudes and will check you, oh. especially if they know you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I spent a long yeah. time as a pickup artist. Yeah, I spent a long time as a pickup artist. And, you know, I've had all kinds of curveballs thrown at me in conversation, thousands of them. Yeah. And very heated environments that are loud and obnoxious and kind of, I, I don't even, Interesting. I didn't even drink for most of them. I was stone sober. So I was like 19. I didn't drink till I was 27. So I was approaching all these women in my teens. And well, that gives you a real advantage if you're sober doing that and they're not. Yeah, but you're doesn't it? Uh, you can be more focused, but you're not as relaxed either. I mean, they call alcohol mm. the social lubricant, and there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. And for men, it'll kind of boost your confidence to say things that you otherwise wouldn't yeah. say. So yeah. I had it, basically in the pickup artist world, this is called doing things the hard way, sober and usually alone, like a lone wolf. That was my preferred. I bring out one buddy or go by myself. And anyway, I think the combination of public speaking, which is very socially uh, a lot of social pressure, and then just yep. going up and talking to you know, hot, yeah. hot woman that I wanted to date, let's say. And, but yeah. these girls, you know, girls will throw in the pickup pick artist world, they call it like a bitch shield. And girls will throw up this wall if they don't know you and they think that, you know, you want something. And it's how to get past that and diffuse that. And I think with the news, especially with the women, the way they kept treating me and stuff and trying to talk over me, I would just, uh, I just kept talking over them sometimes. They were so like, yeah, I'm just yeah no, talking. I know you did. I mean, it was great. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was impressive considering that was, yeah. you know, yeah. new for you. I mean, I, I did it for years and still hate it and still think the whole thing sucks. Oh, I had, the end of I the had day. so much fun. I loved it. Yeah. I love, I oh, love, that's I love Trump too, though. And I learned from Trump. I've studied Trump yeah. for years. Well, you're the type of people who should go on TV a lot. I, I can't stand it because it's just a game. It's just a game. Like, and I yeah. hate playing games and I don't have enough time to explain what I mean. And it's just, I hate I used it. to hate playing games, but I learned how to be the best five-year-old in the room. And I think that's, I think <laughs> they told me they loved it when I was on there, the producers after. I'm sure they did. It was so, I'm sure yeah. they did because you, it's because you did so great. Yeah. And they need, I mean, they need that. People don't realize how yeah. much media needs material. A lot of socializing though, for example, with like the woman I talked to for all these years, like it's, it's just game playing. I mean, it's, you know, you might be in your twenties, but it's a stupid games. It's, it's one in the morning. People are kind of tipsy. Some uh-huh. girl's looking at you. She likes you. You want to talk to her, but it's all just stupid games. Right. And then her friends are cock blocking you, we call it, and like all this stuff. And like it's all just like little little chess games, right? Socializing and stuff. And that, but the TV stuff is very similar to that. And I think uh Barry. Was, yeah. Barry. Yeah. Yeah, game playing, yeah. They they were accusing me of whether it being um uh, they were gonna have to my personal dating life at the I didn't even want to tell them like what was really going on in my life then. Like I was seeing multiple women and stuff. I'm like, this is not are you talking about on the show or on the show pick up on the show yeah they, they, oh they did the full interview is like 20 minutes on youtube there's only like oh. eight minute clip the full one is really interesting because they get it gets way more oh, i don't know that i've seen the full one i'll send you the full one yeah it's uh yeah i don't think I've seen it was a long time yeah it was 20 minutes the, so the the one on youtube with me and janice is eight minutes but the full thing is 20 19 or 20 oh yeah I would like it gets much more heated at the end it gets really fun yeah, I call I called Piers Morgan. I'm like, why you gotta be so judgy, man? You gotta be so judgy all the time, so nosy. Oh, of course they didn't use that. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> oh, and they, he's oh like, you call the girls are like, you're calling him judgy, like in their British accent. And he he goes yeah. he goes he's like he calls me dream. He's like, you have to be the most judgmental person we've ever had on the show. <laughs> he said that to you. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in a quote on your website. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. And, and speaking of Dream, so Dream, jo- Anthony Dream Johnson, tell everybody where that came from. It comes from the... Because you were not born with the middle name of Dream. That's right. Yeah. A few a few people in my life have asked me if that's my real middle name, and it's not. I've thought about changing it, but I'm going to leave it alone. The media calls me Anthony Dream Johnson anyway. They don't even question. They think it's my real name. Well, was it intended to separate you from all the Anthony Johnsons in the world because it's such a plain name? No. Nope. It's, uh, basically, it's from the pickup artist world again. Back in the 2000s, I found the pickup artist community in high school, beginning of my senior year in 2005. And no matter what age you were back then, whether you were 17 or 35 or 50, you didn't go on the pickup artist forums. There's all these forums, right, with you know hundreds of thousands of people. You didn't put your real name, Anthony Johnson. Like I'm from, you know, it was very secret. It was under very taboo thing. Uh-huh. Uh, it's underground society of pickup artists, like the game, the book that went a uh, uh, bestseller and stuff talked about. So you had to pick a name, basically, hmm. to a pseudonym. I see. And uh, it wasn't, 
I think it was actually, it was either the first or the second one I picked, but on this form, it was the first one I picked and I saw that nobody was using it. And I even checked around, I kind of Googled around, like, is anyone else using this name in the whole community? And the closest was this guy named Dreamweaver who was talked about in the game, but nobody actually used the name just Dream. And I loved it. And uh, I think there's more to it than that. Like Socrates, one of our speakers, maybe you met him at the events. A uh, very friendly guy. Oh, you'd love him. You'd no, love Socrates. Think, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. His real name's Dan, not Socrates, obviously. But that was his pickup artist name. But he thinks I, it I appealed see. to me because I dream big and I dream often and I make my dreams happen. And so the name, uh, a lot of people say, oh, you think you're every, every girl's dream, huh? And like, I mean, I'll, I'll absolutely embrace that. Of course I am. But that's not that's not why I picked it. It just it appealed to me. I think on a on a verbal level, I just liked it a lot. It was simple. And then later, I well, started using my real name pretty early on, and that was unusual back then. So I would start using my real name in like two thousand late two thousand seven, early two thousand eight, as a speaker at the conventions. Then, what do you mean by real? Just the Anthony Johnson without the dream. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. yeah. So Anthony Johnson without the dream, and then uh, I was like, I I don't want to lose. It was d- difficult to decide, kind of like the name with the the events, like what I want to call it, what I want to call myself as a speaker. And then someone just said one time, Anthony Dream Johnson. They just combined it all into one. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. My middle name's Paul, but I never use it. I don't care about it. So I'm like, I'll be Anthony Dream Johnson. This will aggravate uh-huh. all these people I don't like. And it it does. It does. Suzanne, uh, her name is what is her name? Su- what's her name? It's Su- Susanna Reed is uh. So similar to you a little bit. Uh, that was on the Good Morning Britain. No. She was livid. Oh. She was you could she couldn't stop saying dream. Oh, I didn't know that was her name. Okay. Susanna. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Susanna, the co host for the, the Piers Morgan show. Yeah. yeah. I have her face in my I can imagine her face, but I didn't know that was her she, name. She yeah. was, let's say, delighted with the name Dream, but so was Piers Morgan. They couldn't get enough of oh, it. Oh, I know. And uh I never knew, you know, if or when I would get in the news, but it's really been helpful. Is it really? Yeah, I was going to say it makes you stand out, and that's what, of course, yeah. helps for the media yep. for sure. And then I'm every girl's dream on top of that. So I mean, it's like a win-win-win, you know, triple win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so last question for you: There is, there appears to be a lot of. Well, maybe this isn't the right word. I was going to say infighting among the men of the manosphere, and maybe that's not correct. So you can tell me. But how does a person cut through all that to figure out, like? I guess we sort of touched on this at the beginning, but like who's worth your, and I've heard you talk about this in other conversations. Like how do you weed out the, I don't know what word you want to use. Um, I don't want to be disparaging per se, the, but the like frauds. Yeah, there you go. The frauds from the legit, yeah. you know, people are trying to make the world better. It's tough. I mean, I'll say this, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. You're asking from like an individual perspective, someone finding this community, this kind of group of topics and speakers and ideas um, you know, number, I would say actually take a pivot outside of anything to do with like the internet and the manosphere and all that study cluster B personality disorders in particular, I'd recommend a book by one of our speakers, retired FBI agent, Joe Navarro. He wrote a book called dangerous personalities. That's dangerous personalities. There's other books too on cluster B disorders. And these will teach you some of the manipulation tactics of people who are, have dangerous personalities independent of these uh, diagnosis, these disorders, right? Are they, cl- yeah. are they cluster B? Well, cluster B is a big one, but are they BPD borderline? Are they HPD? Are they ASPD? Are they a sociopath? Are they a narcissist? Like that's all, that's all mumbo jumbo. Uh, well, it's not all mumbo jumbo, but f- functionally it's mumbo jumbo. It doesn't matter. What matters is that this person, is this person screwed up in the head and are they a charlatan and do, do they have a disorder along with so that? So how do you tell that from online? Online is a problem because it creates a barrier. Like you, you were very skeptical of me before you got to talk to me on the mm-hmm. phone. Then you met me in person, but not because of you per se, but because of what I had experienced of what you're calling the yeah. manosphere. Although I didn't think of it that way, as a, just men online in general, yeah. and what I'd seen on my Facebook page. That's the reason. Yeah, that too. Yeah, and then the, the marketing being bombastic and all that, right? You know, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, that's true. Yeah, we're yeah. going to make women pregnant again. I mean, come on, this is yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> I love Definitely it. Definitely a little, yeah, over the top. I love it. I yep. love it. But uh, so I'll say this, like, you know, in general, it's healthy and useful to study uh, dangerous personalities to watch out for the tactics they use to manipulate people, uh, the way they hide, the way they conceal, the way they lie, the way they don't stop lying sometimes. That's a that's a big trigger. That's a big uh, symptom. Anybody with a cluster B disorder, usually they, a lot of them end up being compulsive pathological liars. They can't stop. They lie so consistently that it's their default for operating, even when it doesn't matter. And this is like, you know, there's a couple of guys I go after in the manosphere for this. They're, they don't stop. I mean, these people are, they just rampant liars or even little things that just don't matter. It doesn't make sense. The reason they do this is they're screwed up on the head. Like, why would you lie about something? So what do you do? 
How can you disassociate with them? How do you do that? Well, if you're just someone looking for advice, you just don't follow them. I mean, it's just ignore yeah. them. You mean in, per- in your personal life? I guess. You gotta, you gotta, no, no, no. I mean, in your you cut um, ties. Like if they're in your community and creating. Oh, I go after him like Trump. I'm like, I'm really. Have you seen the memes I make? I'll send you some of the memes. No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you're in for okay. a surprise. Oh, boy. Okay. I'm the meme master. And uh, uh, it's I loved. It. I actually pay someone my one of my main guys to make these memes. They're really good memes. Yeah, me too. You'll love them. Mine might be a little nicer, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I so what I'm trying to do in the manosphere. I think it's. I think it, me and Will Spencer on his podcast talked about this. We talked about the frauds. I think that honor is like the most foundational element of masculinity in terms of the virtues, like the four that we talk about: strength, courage, mastery, and honor. If you don't have honor, and you don't hear that word anymore, do you? You what? You never hear that word anymore. That's right. So among men, I think it's very important to to value this and to uphold it and to what I'm trying to do in the manosphere is the manosphere is a group of men and fathers. And it should be, I think, by default, a masculine space. Duh. It's a manosphere for mm-hmm. men. Mm-hmm. And that means it should be honorable and that we need to instill a culture of honor in it that doesn't exist and never has. It's an old movement at this point, at least 25 years, even beyond that, if you consider the Warren Farrells and stuff of the 80s and all that, like very old at this point. Will and I call that the proto manosphere uh, before the more modern rendition of it. Anyway, though, I'm, well, don't I'm combative. You think, I, don't you think I fight it, these people? It got sorry. Go ahead. I, yeah, I fight these people in the open. I'll attack them if I need to, particularly if they attack me. I just gloves come off. Some one time last year or early this year, this guy started attacking me, and I was like, okay, you know, people are annoyed at how combative I get. Let me like take a different turn in life. And not, I mean, mm-hmm. not attack him. Just leave him alone. Just ignore him. Mm-hmm. I knew he was kind mm-hmm. of screwy, right? But I was like, let me just leave this guy alone. No, he attacked me again a month later. So a second time to a large audience, 100,000 people. I was like, okay, we're done. Gloves are coming off. This guy's mm-hmm. getting his teeth knocked out on the internet. And I did. I put out a documentary. It's got over 110,000 views now. And it just demolished his life. I mean, caused him a lot of problems by exposing with facts and evidence, the lies and manipulations this guy had been doing for a long time about his life. Lying about his wife, lying about the relationship, lying about her weight, her age. Uh, he's like seven years off his wife's age. Uh, for example, was for years lying about it, all this kind of crazy stuff. Well, making fun of men who married older women. I mean, it was it was it was beyond hypocritical. But anyway, my my theory is to instill a culture of honor in the manosphere and to enforce that uh, through mockery, through memes, through being combative, very Trumpish, Trump style. You know, Sleepy mm-hmm. Joe, Crooked Hillary, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. He's very mm-hmm. influential to me beyond, I mean, I don't even agree with a lot of what he did politically. I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm more, I'm more interested in the culture that's falling apart because that to me will make politics irrelevant, right? If we don't have a mm-hmm. family, the whole country's just going to mm-hmm. die. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I look at what he does and I try to just do the best I can. And I think also that the Manosphere has gotten more, uh, it's actually gotten a lot more frauds in it over time because it's grown. And I think this is natural for any movement. The more money's involved and the more people are involved, you necessarily attract more frauds and they prey on yeah. wounded men. That's those guys you see that are like negative and stuff. It's because they're being manipulated. Yeah. They're hurt usually from a relationship and a screwed up culture and court system that treated mm-hmm. them very unfairly. But then these frauds prey on that. They button push for money and it's really sick. Mm-hmm. And I try to fight it the best I can and encourage other leaders. Instead to Instead of trying to help them get improve their lives, like the Jordan Peterson. Way. Yeah. Which I think Jordan Peterson's rise to fame really, I mean, I don't know what you think, but brought the manosphere much more into the light, mm-hmm. don't you? I mean, it was always there, yeah. but once he came along, wow. I, I mean, YouTube. I consider him like he, manosphere light, but uh, but he talks about a lot of the same issues for sure. That's why I call him manosphere light. Yeah. Well, no, he's not bombastic either. Yeah. His style is yeah, yeah. But, but no, I mean, there, there's it revealed the huge gap that the manosphere is filling, not as an individual public speaker like Jordan Peterson or thinker, but as a community and a movement. And it's very yeah. serious and very important. Uh, some guys call it the men's movement, but I don't think that really sticks. The same way feminism isn't known really as the women's movement, it's known as feminism. No. And Yeah. It, well, it should be because it's not the women's movement. It was the feminist movement. When they said feminist yeah. and tried to call it the women's movement, it made it sound like any woman in the right mind would be a feminist. Like it's a women's movement. Like all women are going to do this. Yeah. And that's why if you don't think like that, you feel like you're there's something wrong with you. Yeah. It was very, very... Uh, um, what's the word? Manipulative. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm trying to make the manosphere uh, the opposite of manipulative. So I'm trying to make it a very good, positive place for men. And it's a difficult battle. It's a fight. Uh, there's money involved. There's people involved. There's history involved. There's a future involved. Um, it's a battle for personalities and for 
space and mind share in the community who's going to lead it and stuff. My, you know, I'm very controversial even in the Manosphere because of the president thing. There's never been a formal leader of the Manosphere, nor has anyone ever tried. The fact that I've been doing that now for a couple of years and the media recognized it really makes people angry in my community because it, it makes me mm. the leader of it in a way that they can't really, if they say I'm not the president, which the one guy I made fun of with that documentary, I exposed him. Mm-hmm. He tried to impeach me at his own conference. That's the first thing he did is we need to impeach the president. And it, so, which is hysterical to me because all it does is reinforce the, the position as president. So it's mm-hmm. just, it's just mm-hmm. little games, but it actually works really well. Five-year-olds have a lot of wisdom that people don't realize. They're very, like, they're very, <laughs> they can be very immature, but they can be very uh, blunt, right? They can be very unbelievably honest, these little kids, because they're so naive about the world. But they, that can be weaponized into, like, what I do now with memes and stuff and little titles and uh, documentaries and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, people, there's an old saying that, um, I don't know if I'm Rancet or who would, but, you know, communists hate uh, comedy. They hate humor. They hate laughter. They really do. Because uh, it can be used to expose them, right? And to, to show how ridiculous the things they believe are in anti-life, anti-freedom. And uh, the memes do that in much the same way. They expose, I don't know where I was going with this, I was trying to thought. But anyway, well, comedy, comedy is important. I'll send you the memes. Yeah, send me the memes. All right, Anthony, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate your coming on. Yeah. And um, and just been great getting to know you the last few months. Thanks. And I look forward to to all that stuff that's coming yeah. out soon from the from the conference yep. i need to interview you on my so channel too. Having... oh yeah i will do that for nice. sure you're probably already starting to have to worry about next year's conference almost <laughs> almost yeah uh, i reach out to some hotels so <laughs> try to get that going early or the sooner the better yeah okay awesome. all right well we will talk again for sure okay thanks for the uh show okay. i appreciate it no problem thanks anthony and that ends this hour of the suzanne banker show Before you leave us, I'd appreciate it if you take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. If you've done that already, or if you can't leave a review on your podcast player for some reason, please consider sharing the show with a friend or a family member. Word of mouth is the primary way we get the word out about The Suzanne Banker Show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.